um good morning everyone um good morning i trust and i hope that um you can you can all see um i hope everyone can see i'm having some some challenges with my with my network today um i don't know what he's doing it keeps on cutting and stopping my stream uh, hence i'm starting late uh, it's the pleasures of internet guys and the pleasures of life um, i really apologize for that but um do let me know um if you guys are able to see just um hit me up um if you're on twitter if you're on instagram if you're on facebook just tell me where you're watching from and tell me if you can if you can see the the stream my my countdown clock was was um looping over and over and it couldn't come off so i just don't know what's happening uh i think the devil is trying to steal to steal the message i think the devil is trying to steal the message but i got slow um i got slow and uh, i've got my my board here um i'll be teaching some some stuff you know i'll be teaching some stuff here and i trust that we will have a, a very very good time in the presence of the lord in the presence of the lord today um so our our point of emphasis today um is the whole issue of of the rapture um like i'm getting a comment here on on youtube um wherever you, you guys are watching man um please start a watch party start a watch party uh let me know that you are watching and that you can see um in check it you should be able to because i don't know what's happening here um it's just acting up very weird okay Mara, i think it's live i think it's live um i hope you guys on youtube can see um but i think it's live now it's live ne? yeah guys please forgive me ne? I don't know what is happening here. Um, just forgive me for that. Um, yeah, l l let us go straight into into the word of God. So we are talking about the issue of of rapture, okay? And um, last week we looked at um, a number of concepts, particularly um, what who will be taken and who will remain. You know so we, we had a, a historical overview and then in this historical overview we looked exactly that um one will be taken another will remain you know okay and then um it was our point of of emphasis that who will be taken and who will remain and then through a number of scriptures throughout the the old and new testament we looked and the scriptures show us that who will be taken and the scriptures tell us that who will remain and what the scriptures are, te are teaching and telling us that the righteous will remain on the earth and all the wicked will be taken away. That's what the Bible teaches us. That that's what the scriptures say, that the righteous will remain. And I need to emphasize this. I need to emphasize that I am teaching and I believe in a literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is coming back. I, they, I am in no way saying that the Lord Jesus is not going to come back physically and literally. There is no way I am saying that. Okay, in case someone is misunderstanding or in case someone thinks that's what I'm, I'm, I'm rebutting. I'm not rebutting the return of the Lord Jesus. I think we can all agree that Jesus is coming back on a literal return of the Lord Jesus. I believe that all of us can agree on that. But now, concerning his return, there are many theories, there are many teachings of men, there are many sacred cows, which will have to dismantle, which will have to unteach. So before we can properly teach, we have to unteach. Before we can learn what the Bible really says, we have to unlearn some, some things. So there are certain concepts which have to be unlearned. There are some certain things which have to be untaught. Okay, so that we can reteach. So that we can exp 
explain the things of God more excellently and more elaborately so that we can we can we can believe we can believe the right way okay um i'm seeing that most of my youtube friends are seeing that they can see i'm glad because right now on my on my screen it's not showing me who it's showing on youtube i have no idea i think the devil is trying to steal this message i'm telling you the devil is trying to steal this message and uh but anega alunge he won't you know my, my screen on youtube is just blank for some reason I cannot see that my friends are seeing. Okay, Mamruti shows me that uh, 20 people are watching. Good. Uh, we've got a nice audience. Um, I see my, my friends on YouTube. I can see the Facebook comments. I see CJ. I see uh, uh, Kosi, Mangwe. I see Ernest. Yeah, I see my, my Facebook family. You know, Facebook, I can see you all. Um, yeah, but uh, on my wife's phone here, I can see. So I think I have to put on my second laptop. So I'm going to put on this laptop so that I'm, i am able to see what everyone is saying there on youtube okay and um hopefully if time allows i can even take some questions would it be good if, if i can take questions uh because I, I don't want to take this longer than an hour okay uh but i really want to be able to do a question and answer session you know so that i can answer your questions you know because i'm teaching what i know guys okay I, I i'm not imagining this i am teaching what i know i know what i'm teaching and i know yeah i know what i'm teaching i know what i am talking about i know it okay so if time allow us um i'll be able to to take some questions because i don't want to go over an hour okay i don't want to go over an hour it's a long series um week after week okay um and then hopefully today i'll be able to, to take questions and then respond to them as well okay because what you are teaching we know it okay uh, so let us start here let us start here the, the bible tells us in the book of of first peter let me put this verse on the screen i think this one it will be good if i put it on the screen let's go to the book of first peter second peter sorry second peter um chapter number one let me quickly go there second peter chapter 1 verse 16 second peter 1 16 so look at i'm highlighting it here ne? um highlight yeah here it is highlighted for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our lord jesus but were eyewitnesses of his majesty here it is highlighted so why am i starting with this verse i'm starting with this verse that you can realize that the bible foresaw the bible foreknew the bible foretold that concerning the coming of the lord jesus there will be many cunningly devised fables so there are fairy tales cunning fairy tales which have been devised by men concerning the return of our lord jesus so I want you to know that what many of my friends, I love you so much, but what many of you believe is a fable. It's a cunning devised fable straight from the pit of hell to, to remove our focus from what the Bible tells us, to remove our focus from, from our position in Christ and because what we are waiting what people are teaching ne, is that the, the, the next greatest event in all of Christianity is the taking and the going away of the church. That's what people are teaching, that the next great event is the going away of the church. But the Bible does not teach that. There is absolutely nowhere in the Bible where the Bible is telling us, where the Bible is teaching us that the next greatest event in Christianity is the going away of the church. That's what people are teaching. That's what people are holding on to. And that is our eschatology. But eschatology was simply meaning our view of the end times. Okay, so our eschatology will determine our theology. Our eschatology will determine how we practice church today. 
But what does the Bible tell us? The Bible promises and the Bible tells us of an emerging church, of a victorious church. So there is a victorious church. There is an overcoming church that the world is waiting for. The Bible tells us that all, all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So there is a revealing of an overcoming church. There is a revealing of a church in authority and of a church in power that we are all waiting for. We are not waiting for some event whereby people will be snatched. So last week we looked. We looked at particularly that who will be taken and who will remain. And those of you who are there, you remember that the righteous will remain and the wicked will be taken away from the earth. Let me just quote one verse from last week. One verse, oh, it is such a beautiful verse. Uh, let us go into it. Proverbs 10, verse 30. I want, I want you all to say, I don't want to just quote it. Many of the verses I will quote, but this one I will read. I will put it on the screen so that you can all see it. Look at it here. Look at it. Let me highlight it in yellow. Proverbs 10 verse 30. The righteous shall never be removed. The righteous shall never be removed. But the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The righteous shall never be removed. But the wicked will not inherit the earth. So that's what the Bible tells us. The Bible says the righteous will never be removed. Hey, hey, listen to me. Those of you who are still stubborn, listen to me. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will never inherit the earth. So the wicked won't inherit the earth, but the righteous will never be removed. The righteous will remain. So we have not followed a cunning and a devised fable after the rudiments and the traditions of men. We have not followed that. But what are we following? We are following the scriptures. We are going through the scriptures with a scarlet thread. And we are looking at what the Bible teaches us and what we are waiting for. So what we as a church, the next great event is the return of the Lord Jesus. And the church rejoices for that day. The church is waiting for that day. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, it is the spirit and the bride they say come lord jesus so the bride and the spirit we are crying and we are singing a song and the song we are singing is the come lord jesus so the next great event is a song the next great event is a song the spirit and the bride is singing and we are simply saying come lord jesus return lord jesus so we need to demystify this okay so now i'm gonna look so God willing today, I'm going to go into Matthew 24. And when we go into Matthew 24, we're going to look at those, at that prophecy, at the teaching of Matthew 24, and I'm going to demystify it for you and show you what Jesus actually was trying to say. Because context, context is everything. Now, let me tell you what I mean by context. When I say context is everything. Let me first have a cup of coffee. Let me have a cup of coffee. Come on, guys. I'm home. Let me have a cup of coffee and relax. Um, get your popcorn, guys. Um, get your popcorn. Get something to drink. And yeah, to us who are pursuing the scriptures, to us who want to see what the Bible really teaches. So there are two things you need to understand. Two things. There are two types of preachers. There are two types of people who are teaching the Bible. Two. There are those, when they read the scriptures, they draw out tradition. And then there are those, when they read the scriptures, they draw out truth. So we have two types of preachers. Preachers of truth and preachers of tradition. So now, which one are you going to be? Are you going to be a preacher of truth? Or are you going to be a preacher of tradition? The Bible says, Jesus says, you have made the word of God of none effect because of your tradition. So tradition has the capacity in itself to make the word of God null and void. To make the word of God devoid of its power, our traditions. So we need to be careful of the traditions that we establish around scripture. We need to be careful of that. 
And that's what the enemy will want us to do. To, to create tradition. Now, what are these traditions? These traditions are the fables. Fairy tales, fables. The cunning devised fables. They are the traditions. And they are the traditions which deny us of our inheritance. They are the traditions which deny us of our position in Christ. So come on guys, let us reason together. Let us reason with the scriptures. Let us allow the Bible to say what the Bible wants to say. So a true Bible scholar is not looking at the Bible to confirm what he already believes. A true Bible scholar looks at the Bible, reads the Bible, to find out what the Bible truly tries to say. Not to, not to confirm what you have believed, but to see what the Bibles have to say. So it is important that we do not read the scriptures through the lens of what we have heard. Through the lens of what our, our, our predecessors or what others have said. It is important, guys. It is so, so, so important. And those of you on Instagram, I'm not ignoring you guys. Eh? Hello, we are still there. So, um, let us go. Let us go to the book of. Let us go to the book of uh, Matthew. So we'll be looking at two things today. We'll be looking at two words. We're gonna do a, but before we go to Matthew four and and analyze the chapter. I want us to understand two words. Okay, either two, three, or four words, okay? But primarily it is two words. And what are these words? Let us write them down here. Give the word taken. One shall be taken. Okay, I hope it's visible. Yeah, it is visible. So, the word taken, it is a word. We're going to do a Bible study. Okay, we're going to do a Bible study on this word, taken, so that we can understand what it really means. So, what am I going to do? We're going to do a word study, and as we do a word study, we're going to go through everywhere in the Bible where we find this word. And in the Greek, it is the word, in the Greek, it is the word, para. Lam ba no. So it, it is a compound word. It is a compound of two words. It is a compound of two words. The word para and lambano. Para and lambano. It is a compound, a, a conjecture of these two words. So today's teaching, I'm not preaching. Ne? Today is not a preaching and there's fire and brimstone. No, today is not a preaching. Today, it is a lecture. It is a teaching. Okay? So, if you are looking for entertainment, maybe go watch another live stream. But if you want to learn, if you want to be educated, if you want to take notes, you are on the right live stream. Okay? But if you want fire and you are coming out, please, switch off this live stream and go and watch another live stream. But if you are a seeker of truth, Okay, you are, in, you are in good company. If you are a seeker of truth, and we will together go through the scriptures. Okay, we will together. In fact, what I will do, I will try and summarize my Bible notes and put them up on my website. Okay, selupeterson.co.za. Okay, um, I will try and compile them together on selupeterson.co.za so that you guys can look and, and download the notes. Okay, and then go and study for yourself because that's what we want. We don't want to follow a cunningly devised fable. Okay, and I don't want you to take my teaching at face value. I want you to go and scrutinize it. Okay, and I want us to have a discussion on this thing because that's what they did in the Bible. They would sit down and discuss the scriptures. Okay, so I want us to get to a place whereby I can even do question and answer and then you can even share your perspectives with me as well okay so I, I will arrange for that I will because I want us to talk and really see what the Bible has to say okay so I'm not, I'm not trying to talk over your, your, your head and talk at you but I'm talking with you and then I'm giving a teaching and a teaching I hope that will be very encouraging so do me a favor uh, 
give me a thumbs up on the video on especially on youtube so that uh, my my analytics can be good so that other people can see this thing okay so we're gonna be doing this word study so now paralambano number one number one paralambano it means to take to take i hope it's visible okay to take that's like parallel at first so i'm gonna unpack the word okay i'm gonna i'm gonna unpack the word the word paralambano it means to take remember one shall be taken and another shall be left so last week i spent in numerous times so please those of you on youtube go and check the previous video those of you on facebook go and check the previous video my instagram also to go and check the previous live stream okay so we explained that the righteous will remain just like proverbs 10 30 says the righteous will never be taken and the wicked will not inherit the earth okay so now we're looking at the word itself and where it appears so that we can understand it in its right context because remember the bible was not written in english or zulu or venda or africans the bible was written in greek hebrew some Aramic, and a little bit of of latin so that is an important part in our teaching that everyone has to grasp and understand okay now what am i talking about context Man of God, context, context. You guys like talking about context, context, and you're confusing us. Okay, let me tell you what's so important about context. Today, we are living in 2021. Okay? We are living in 2021. And um, in, we have a sport, and this sport is called rugby. Okay? We all, we all, we all know what rugby is, right? Um, we have many other sports, basketball and stuff like that. But most of these sports, they've got a mascot. They've got a mascot. Um, look at rugby. They've got a mascot. Look at look at uh, American football. Many sports. They've got a mascot, and the mascot represents the team. So let us look at rugby. We have two teams. Okay, we have the Sharks all the way in Durban, and we have the Blue Bulls. I'm a Blue Bull fan. Blue Blue Bull fan, right here in Pretoria. So we've got Blue Bulls, and we've got Sharks. Now we write a newspaper headline a newspaper article after the soccer after the rugby game and in this newspaper article we put a, a, a headline and the headline it says bulls eat sharks for dinner right it's a headline and the purpose of this headline is to be sensational so that people can go and buy the newspaper now three thousand years later 3,000 years in the future, somebody discovers this newspaper article and they read this newspaper article. When they read this newspaper article, they discover it and it says, bulls eat sharks. So to the person reading, if they do not understand our context, they will think that back in the day, bulls were blue. They will think that back in the day, sharks could walk on land. That sharks were eaten by bulls. That bulls used to eat fish. That bulls used to eat seafood. That's what they will think if they don't have the context. So context is important. To understand that we had a game. And this game. But the newspaper does not explain the context. It's a historical context you will need to have. So it's also the same with the scriptures. That sometimes we just read a verse and we run to town with it without understanding the context. We, we go all over the place and say, yeah, bulls eat sharks. Bulls eat sharks. That I'm a bull in the spirit and I'm eating sharks. Something like that, you know. And then we can get so lost and miss the meaning altogether. Now, when we come, and we try to unpack these things. People think we are taking the foundations. People think we are trying to be better than others. That, and that is not the case, okay? That is not the case at all. I'm not trying to be sensational, but I'm trying to give you perspective 
so that we can understand the intended meaning. You see, the task for any Bible teacher and for anyone reading the Bible, the task is one. And that task is to, under, is to understand the intended meaning. So, my responsibility and my task is that as I'm reading what Peter said, if Peter is sitting in the audience, Peter must be able to say, yeah, no, bravo, that's exactly what I was saying. Because I promise you, you know, in the great cloud of witnesses, some of the, the apostles and prophets, when they listen to our sermons, they're like, ah, I never said, that. is that what I said? Me, me, I said that. They, they must be wondering, you know. So that's why context is so important. And when you speak about context, when you speak about context, uh, we have our literary context, right? With the literary context, we are looking at the, the, the style of writing, okay? That what kind of writing is this? Is this a historical book? Is this a prophetic book? Is this a narrative? Is this a, an epistle? Is this a gospel? You know, because the way it is written, it influences our interpretation. Is this a proverb? Is this a poetic writing? Is it allegorical? Is it meant to be interpreted literally? Or is it an idiom? Okay, those things, they matter. That is the literary context. Okay, next thing, we have our scripture context. And when we look at our scripture context, we have to look at the verse. Oh, and when we look at the verse, we have to determine the context. And when we determine the context, we look at the immediate surroundings of the verse. Because we do not read the verse uh, in a vacuum. The verse was not written in a vacuum. So we look at it in the context of the, of the surrounding verses. So that we can have the understanding. And not only that, we have to look at the context of the book. So if you're reading the book of Matthew, we have to look at the context of the book. But not only that, we have to look at the context of the chapter. And then look at the context of the book. And then we look at the context of the testament, all the New Testament. And then we look at it at the, in the context of the entire Bible, filtering it through the cross. That way, we are able to find what the verse was trying to say. Because that's the only way we are going to find application for the verse today. That is the only way. Okay? And then, we need to have a cultural context. And the cultural context, we need to understand the culture of the day. The way they did things and the way they spoke, their attire, their dress code, their, their manner of living, just like the example I made. You know, because you have to understand the culture of today that we had sport. And sport was a means of recreation. But you also have newspapers. And when you look at newspapers, you have to understand that when you look at the newspaper, the headline is sensational. The headline is there so that you can buy the newspaper to grab your attention. It is exaggeration. So in the headline, there is a lot of exaggeration and sensationalism so that you can go and buy the article. And read the article okay even right now we have articles on social media and stuff like that the headlines are sensational so that you can go and click on it today we have what we call clickbait we put clickbait there we put a nice thumbnail and a nice title click so you can click on the video and watch it so I can click on the article and really it is clickbait so without that context you're gonna miss the story altogether if someone 5,000 years in the future opens my YouTube channel, they have to the, this clickbait. I want you to click on this and read it. There is a thumbnail. I want you to look at this thumbnail to grab your attention. To grab your attention so you can come and look and watch the video and read the article. That's why cultural context is important. But not only cultural context, we also need to understand historical context because what was happening in the bible happened within a particular historical setting it happened within a particular historical setting so who was king 
at the time. You see today, the, the historical political setting of today, we understand that uh, there is fake news happening. We understand that there is censorship happening. We understand all these things. Okay? The historical context of the day. Do you see the importance of all this? And so now, in order for us to find ourselves again, in order for us to bridge the gap, because a good Bible teacher will bridge the gap so that we can find the intended meaning. Because there are many meanings we can draw out from scripture, but we need to find the intended meaning. I see Apostle Music uh, in the comments. I'm a bull in the spirit and I'm eating sharks. <laughs> there is power. Uh, I'm back. I, I see you guys are back on YouTube and we're all on the same page. I'm running this. Um, if you're with me on, on Instagram, hi guys on Instagram. I saw Minister Sims. I see, I see all of you guys. I see you all. Um, I acknowledge you. There is power. Okay, there is power. Uh, let me have a sip of coffee. My car televisor. There's too much power. So now, we are gonna, in order for us to find what that verse was trying to say, because in order for me to reteach the verse, I have to unteach it first. Okay? And in, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put every nail on this coffin, ne? and I'm gonna bury this teaching softly. You know, nail by nail by nail by nail. So that no one will be with excuse. Okay, so that no one will be with excuse. So now we are looking at the word. So I'm looking at a dictionary, okay? The dictionary I'm using is Zodiates. So I've got a number of dictionaries, okay? Listen, guys, get your material here. I've got dictionaries. So see, I'm using my, on my iPad here, I've got four dictionaries, okay? So I can look at the Greek and the Hebrew, okay? And on my gaming laptop here as well. I've got another dictionary and numerous, numerous Bible verses. Numerous. And on my iPad as well. Okay, so I want you to understand that. Jimmy um, Lebazalan. Where did I put my notebook? Okay, here it is. Here is my notebook here. I also have my notebook. Right here. So I'm going to, I'm going to, unpack this thing for you nice and slow okay so now let us look at the first meaning let us look at the first meaning to take so paralambano number one it means to take okay to take number one that is the first meaning of the word to take it also means to it also means to re receive ah i put the e on the wrong place sorry no, but it also means to to receive no it is it's right to receive i hope that you guys can read if you can read someone says i can read jesus so the first word of paralambano taken that word one shall be taken i'm explaining that one shall be taken another shall remain the first one there the one that the paralambano it means to take Number two, it means to receive. Okay? It means to receive. T number three, it means to bring near. To bring near. As if to pull up. To bring near. Ne so, now, when I summarize this word, ne my dictionary here says, it says to take to oneself, to seize, or take into one's possession. That's what para lambano simply, para means close, lambano to seize. Para lambano, to bring close, to take, to receive. Okay, so now let us look. Let us look at everywhere we see this word. Ne? We first see it in Matthew. No, let's, let's leave Matthew. Let's go to, um, no, Matthew 4. Matthew 4. I put my other notes on my phone and my phone is streaming Jesus so it's gonna take a bit longer let's go to Matthew chapter number 4 Matthew 4 verse 5 so 
I wonder when I'm looking at this one, I want us to see the context and the use of the word. So this word taken, when you see the word taken, you're not supposed to interpret it in the positive sense. Okay, so it is in the negative tense and in the negative sense, this word taken. You have to interpret the word taken in the negative sense. Okay, in the negative sense. So it is not it is not those whom the Lord the Lord favors to take and bring to you. It is not that. It's not whom the Lord favors. Okay, it's not those whom the Lord favors. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the usage of this word in the Bible. So I'm gonna start with Matthew itself. Because I grew up in Matthew 4. So I wanna look at this word in Matthew itself. And I wanna show you something. So in Matthew chapter number chapter number four, verse five and verse eight. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter number four, verse five and verse eight. In fact, let me let me do this. I'm gonna put it on the screen for you. Uh Matthew, Matthew uh chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four, verse five. Matthew chapter four, verse five. Um, okay, put it on the screen. Uh, stupid verse. Yeah, I believe you guys can see it now. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. And when you look at Matthew 4, verse 5, the Bible says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Do you see that? It is the devil. The devil takes Jesus. And puts him on the pinnacle of the, this is in the temptation in the world. So the devil takes Jesus. The devil takes Jesus. My goodness. This is the time who takes. Yo, yo, yo. The devil takes Jesus and puts him on a pinnacle of the temple. So the word paralambano. You see, it is in the negative sense. When the devil takes Jesus and puts the him on a on the pinnacle of the temple. Get the devil who's doing that in the negative sense. Okay, in the negative sense, the devil taken Jesus and put him in the pinnacle. And then we go to verse 5 to verse 8. To verse 8. We see the word paralambano again as taken. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So we see the devil taketh up. The devil taketh up Jesus into a high mountain. The Satan who is doing these things. He taketh him. You see, so it is in the negative sense to take. Now, now let us go a little bit deeper. Let us go a little bit deeper with this word. Let's go to, to John chapter 19. Now I'm going to go to John 19. I, I want to put it on the screen for you as well. Uh, it's a pity that today I cannot put my verses on Instagram. Uh, guys, uh, but I hope you guys have your Bibles. John 16. John 16, verse 19. John 16, 19. I hope I'm, I'm opening the right one. Uh, let me open here. No, sorry, man. John 19. My bad, my bad. John 19. John 19, verse 16. John 19, verse number 16. I'm putting it on the screen on the screen for you. Uh, okay. There it goes. There it goes. John 19, verse 16. Look at it. It says, Then delivered he him before unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. They took Jesus. Yeah, let me make it a bit bigger. Yeah, I think now you guys can see. Ne? And they took Jesus and led him away. They took Jesus. So the word for took right there. The word took is paralamban. One shall be taken. So they took Jesus and they crucified him. So... Can you see how the Bible makes use of the word paralambano? They took Jesus and they crucified him. 
They took him and crucified him. That is the use of taken, took. Get the word paralambano. They took him and crucified So you see that the taking is not a positive thing. The taking here is a bad thing. They take. Okay, let me make it simple. Take bad. To take is bad. Taking is bad. So they took Jesus and crucified him. My catalyzer, Jesus. No. So they took Jesus and crucified him. So the taking is bad. So when the Bible says one shall be taken, that taking is a bad thing. Don't rejoice, we are gonna be taken. Hey, the taking is a bad thing. The wicked shall be taken. The taking is a bad thing. It is a bad thing. Now, yo, my goodness, my goodness, my so one shall be taken and another shall remain. So just like in the days of Noah, the wicked were taken and Noah remained. Just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked were taken and Lot remained. So the wicked are taken and the righteous, they remain. So the taking is a bad thing. To take is very, very, very bad. It is very bad to take. Very bad. Now, one shall be taken and another shall be left. So now, we look at the seven word to be left. One shall be taken, another shall be left. So now when you look at the word left, to leave, left, one shall be taken and another shall be left. Okay guys, you forgive me for my handwriting. You know, smart people, the handwritings are, you know, come on. Nah, my little dog, come on, you know. You call me Dr. Cyril, amen. So, uh, to be left, now I look at the word left. And the word left in the Greek is this word. I struggle to pronounce it. To the word afiemi. And it means it means to it's got two meanings. The first meaning it means to dismiss. So this word one shall be left. Ne, to be left here. Ne, cause we like saying left behind. I wanna left behind. There are so many teachings, so many movies, so many things about left behind. And unfortunately, the only thing that is left behind is the Bible. I want the only thing. The oh, no, I don't care. The only thing they left behind is the Bible. That's the only thing. They're just preaching traditions that they took from Catholic priests trying to defend the Pope. And we are taking these teachings and we are using them as agids, as foundations of the gospel. But the word, the word left, one shall be taken, another shall be left. The word left there, it means to dismiss. It means to dismiss. So those who are left, they are dismissed from judgment. <laughs> they are dismissed from judgment. So, get the word left. That's what it means. We leave them. That's why I'm leaving them. I'm not taking them to judgment. I am leaving them. One shall be taken, another shall be left. So, the left there is to be left to judgment. Left to judgment. Dismiss. No, taken to judgment and left to be dismissed. Left to inherit. Left to inherit the earth. Left to occupy. Left to prosper. Left to continue. Left to live. Left. So the ones who are taken, they are taken to prison. They are taken to judgment. They are taken to the lake of fire. And these ones are left to reign and rule with the Messiah. So one shall be taken, another shall be left. So taken to judgment. Take is a bad word. To take into judgment. Okay, so now that's what the word means. Now I'm going to show you how the Bible writers make use of the word afiemi. The word afiemi in English is translated as left. 
So I'm gonna look at what the word afiemi means. So I'm gonna make this example again. I made it a while back. And the, the, the example goes like this. It goes like this. Um, direct translation does not work. You see, directly translating something does not always work. For example, to say, You know how in Bitori, how we speak about, Like an overall, we don't call it overall or bike. It's, it's how you look but you cannot say in velocity in, in another language you can't say in velocity you understand because it's a word which only exists in our language and you cannot directly translate it that is just like to say in, in vernac we understand what we mean but when you translate that into English, it does not make sense. I want they are coming back. I want, so that's why we need to go back and look at the word. What the word really means. And that's what we're going to be doing today. The word left. Left behind. Because there are so many movies, so many teachings, so many things left behind. But the only thing they are leaving behind is the Bible. That's the only thing which is left behind. But she are Bible and they are teaching cunningly devised fables so let's look at the word left here let's look at the word left it means to dismiss so now jesus used this word in matthew 13 verse 36 in matthew 13 verse 36 jesus uses this word let's go to matthew matthew 13 verse 36 I'm just looking at my notes here matthew 13 verse 36 Uh, oh, I didn't put it on the screen, sorry. Yeah, now it's on the screen. If it's on, if it's on the screen and you can see, say hallelujah, say amen. And you can see, if you can see it. Because it gets confusing sometimes. I highlighted it here. Matthew 13, verse um, 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare to us the parable of the tares in the field. So the word sent, the word sent, Jesus sent the multitudes away. He sent them away. Is, is this word, afiemi. So in other places, in other places, the translators translate this word, afiemi as left. Because it's important that we visit the classical languages because somebody, Somebody went and translated it. Okay, somebody did this. Somebody translated it. And it's important to also look at the original meaning. Or how it could, it could have also been translated. So, this is the context of this word, how this word is used in the Bible. He sent the multitudes away. I want, they, they did not get to participate in the discussion. I want to dismiss. When Jesus dismissed the multitudes, Remember, that's what the word means, dismiss. He sent the multitudes away. He dismissed them. Give the word, afiemi. The word which is translated as left. To dismiss. Okay? We also see this word in another place in the Bible. First Corinthians. Let's go to Corinthians chapter number, number 7. First Corinthians 7. First Corinthians 7 from verse 11. First Corinthians 7 from verse 11 to 13. Let me highlight it for you and put it on the screen. Let me highlight and put it on the screen. Do you guys see here? First Corinthians 11, 11 first Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11 to 13. But but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not her husband put away his wife. The one that put away is the word afiemi to dismiss verse 12 but to the rest speak speak i not the lord if any brother hath a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to do and she be pleased to, to dwell with him let him not put her away that is the word afiemi to dismiss verse 13 and the woman 
which has an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. That word leave him, get the word afiemi, to leave, to put away, or what? to dismiss. Get the word afiemi, left. One shall be taken and another shall be left. The word left, it means to dismiss. It means to put away. It means to send away. To dismiss. To leave. The word, we can also, it can also be, be interpreted as um, to to release, I want to release from judgment, to dismiss from judgment, to dismiss from this punishment. That's what the word means. But the second, the second meaning of the word, okay, the second meaning of this word, afiemi, the second meaning of the word, afiemi, let me try writing with a different color, just to keep things interesting, you know, with a different color. And this color, um, I, I use green. Uh, the second meaning of the word afiemi, it means to let go, to let go free, or to free someone. It means to let go free, to free someone, or it means to, to escape, to escape. So when they say one shall be left, it literally means one shall escape judgment or one shall go free from the judgment. That's what the word afiemi means. Ne? The second meaning of the word. Now let us go deeper into the Bible and see how the Bible makes use of this word. Matthew 18. Let's go to Matthew 18. So remember today, man, we are just we are just doing a word study. And then after understanding what this word means. We're going to jump into Matthew 24. Uh, what's that verse again? Where did I put it? Matthew 18, yes. Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew 18, verse number 27. Matthew 18, 27. Look at what it says. The word afiem is also used here. Let me, yes, verse 27. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He loosed him and forgave him the debt. Oh, sorry, here it is. Then the Lord of the servant loosed him and forgave him the debt. There it is right there. So, the word afiemi to be left, it means to be forgiven. The word translated forgiven, get left. So, the word left behind is also translated as forgiven. One shall be taken, one shall be left. The word left is afiemi. Afiemi, it means to dismiss. To dismiss from punishment. To dismiss from the, the, the judgment. But number two, it means to let go free, to let someone go free. You are leaving them. Leave him. Let them go free. That's what the word left means. It also means to escape. Those who escape everlasting punishment and judgment. Those who are saved. Those who are in the Lord. They escaped judgment. They escaped punishment. They escaped the Lord which falls on those who are taken. They escape. That's what the word means. To escape. It also means to be forgiven. It is also translated as forgiven. So, the parable of how the Lord forgave his unrighteous servant. The word they forgave. Give the word afiemi. And the word afiemi is the same word that Matthew uses for left behind. Let us look at that word again in Matthew chapter number Number 18, verse 32. Let's jump to verse 32. 32. Let's highlight it. Verse 32. Um, yeah. I hope you can all see. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because you desirest me. Ne? 
Verse 35. Let's highlight this as well. Verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts do forgive, not everyone is bad. There are trespasses. So, it is the word forgive. To be forgiven, one shall be left. The word there, left, it also means one shall be forgiven. So if you are left, you are forgiven. You are forgiven of the trespass. You are forgiven. And you don't get to participate in the judgment which shall come upon us in the last days. That's what it means. So I believe that right now, you're all in the same page with me. Uh, to be forgiven, to be let go. Um, now, let us go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Uh, last verse, last verse, and then we go a little bit deeper. Last verse. Deuteronomy chapter number 15. I know it can be a bit of a hard study today. Ne? Deuteronomy 15 verse 2. Uh, but like I said, man, um, if today you want fire, uh, today I want a fire, but I'm not even sweating. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Verse number 2. Deuteronomy 15. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth out unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact of his neighbor or of his brother because it is the Lord's release. It is the Lord's release. It is exactly the same word afiemi in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. It is exactly the same word which is used right there. So, um, there shall be a release. We won't get the judgment. We won't get the punishment we deserve. We shall be released, those who are left behind. So, I know this is what they teach. They say, we shall be taken in the rapture to be away with the Lord and then the... the the, the devil and stuff like that will, will, will have his way in the earth. And those who are left behind will be dealing with the devil. But the, the Bible teaches otherwise. The Bible teaches that those who are left behind, they shall be forgiven. Those who are left behind, they shall be released. Those who are left behind have escaped the judgment. Those who are left behind are forgiven. Those who are left behind, they are dismissed. So, one shall be taken, another shall be left. I trust that now we have an, a, a, a perfect understanding of what these two words mean. I trust that we have a perfect understanding. And now I have to fly. I have to fly. I, wanna, I, I want us to look at one more use of this word. One more use of this word in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, one more use of this word. Now this one is so powerful. This one's so powerful. I want you to see it. Matthew 6, verse number, number 12. Matthew 6, 12. Let me highlight it in green this time. Matthew 6, 12. There we go. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors forgive us our debts as we forgive who our debtors so the one left it also means the forgiveness of debts so those who are left there are those who are washed in the blood whose sins are forgiven who have been made white by the blood of the lamb whose whose sins those that are red as scarlet that are made white as snow so these are the forgiven, those who have received the substitution, those who are covered in the blood, those whose sin is forgiven are left behind. That's what the Bible teaches. Those whose sins are forgiven are those who are left behind. I hope I'm not neglecting you guys here. Ne? Because yeah, uh, I'm looking at the camera there. So it is those who are left behind. So which one are you? Are you taken? Or will I be left behind? It's your choice. It's your choice. But remember, ne? the important thing is that Jesus is coming. So, in as much as I, I am demystifying this thing, in as much as I'm doing that, 
it is important to understand that our emphasis is not the going away of the church our emphasis is the return of the lord that jesus is returning that jesus is coming back that is our emphasis so we have shown from the scriptures that number one ne, the wicked shall be taken the righteous will remain that was last week today we explained what it means to be left behind then those who are left behind is the church and the church has been forgiven the church has been dismissed from judgment the church has been cleansed with the blood the church has been let to go free the church has been forgiven the church has escaped judgment the church remains and the church inherits the earth that was our our, our, our emphasis okay that, that was our emphasis and now let us go and look at matthew chapter number 24. in matthew 24 i'm gonna i'm gonna read this one eh? In Matthew 24, verse 1 to verse 3. Okay, no, this one I must put it on the screen. No way. This one's powerful. This is this will be my last verse for today. I hope. No, this, this one is too powerful. I cannot leave it. Let me put it on, let me put it on the on the screen. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter number 24. Verse number 1 to 3. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Can you see? Can you see even the Bible tells you? Ne, the Bible tells us here. Look at this headline. Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. Jesus foretells the destruction of... I'm trying to change my color here. Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. So this is what you need to understand. That when Jesus starts with Matthew 24, Matthew 24 is all about the destruction of the temple. Matthew 24 is not about the end of the world. Matthew 24, let me repeat. Matthew 24 is not about the end of the world. Matthew 24 is about the destruction of the temple. I can see here on Facebook, a... Uh, a lot of guys that are saying uh, they need a question and answer. I will try that. Maybe let's have a question here. Okay, put the questions here. Ne? Either I can answer them or, or in the next video. Uh, more Facebook uh, and WhatsApp. And uh, not WhatsApp, look at WhatsApp. On YouTube, uh, put those questions there. Let's see if we can touch one or two today. So, but Matthew 24. Matthew 24, it deals with the destruction of the temple not the end of the world now when we teach Matthew 24 we teach the end of the world but when the bible is telling us about Matthew 24 what Jesus was telling or talking about he was talking about the destruction of the temple it's about the destruction of the temple Matthew 24 let's look at it again let me show you let me show you children of God Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. Let me put it in red. Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. So what we're going to read here is, is about the, the destruction of the temple. Now look at this part, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So his disciples are doing one thing. What are they doing? They are showing him the buildings of the temple. To show him the buildings of the temple. This is all about the temple. So Matthew 24. Everything we're going to read about the one being taken, one remaining. It's about the temple. It's about the temple. So then went out. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the building of the temple. And then Jesus is going to start talking about the destruction of the temple. 
He's going to talk about the destruction of the temple. And that's what Matthew 24 is about. Verse 2. Verse 2. Let's move. Verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be here, there shall not be left here, one stone upon another, that, that, that shall not be thrown down. Jesus meant that. He meant that there shall not be left one stone upon another. Jesus is talking about the temple. And says when you are looking at this temple, this temple shall be destroyed. And in the destruction of the temple, there shall not be left one stone upon another. It shall be destroyed. All, all stones shall be unearthed. Not one stone will be left upon another. He's talking about the destruction of the temple. Now, people, the, the rapture people, they are saying that the temple must be rebuilt so that it can be destroyed. I mean, how stupid can you be? No, honestly, no. What, what processor are you using? No, it must be Pentium 1, honestly. No, to say now we must rebuild the temple so that it can be destroyed. No. No. So, this in Matthew 24 has already happened. It has already been fulfilled. Remember, the context of Matthew 24 where the, the verse appears, one shall be taken and another shall be left. That is the context of that verse. Okay? So give Matthew 24. And the Matthew 24, it is speaking primarily about the destruction uh, of the church. Okay, I see a question here by, by Rick Morty. Um, there, are, there are a number of dictionaries. Ne? A number of dictionaries you can visit like Vine's Dictionary, uh, like Zodiates Dictionary, uh, uh, Oxford Dictionary of Names and Places in the, in the, in the New and Old Testament. Um, I, I'll copy them in the comments again. Ne? So you can just rewatch what I said, this, post, this portion, and then I'll copy them again on the, on the, on the comments. And I see wise men, Wiseman Kumalo, are you please touch on the doctrine that people will be saved by their own blood? Yeah, over then, uh, I'm gonna come over that one. It's a particular teaching. Now, it needs a session on its own. Uh, this is where we do talk about the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's table. And then there, I'm gonna dwell particularly. So, Wiseman Kumalo, uh, just know that there is, a, there is a, a teaching coming, particularly for that. Okay? Yeah, I'm gonna do a teaching particularly on that. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do a teaching particularly on that. So th those are the dictionary, Vine's dictionary, um, Zodiac's dictionary. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put the, I'll, I'll put them down in the comments once I'm done. I, I, I'll link them in the description as well, so that those who are interested can go in and look at it. Uh, well, verse three. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, what, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the end of the age is not the end of the world. The end of the age. Get the age of the law. Get the age of the Old Testament. Get the age of the temple standing. What shall be the sign of the end of the age? Not of the end of the world. Of the age of the law. What will be the sign of the total destruction of this age? It is when uh, the Lord releases the judgment upon Jerusalem and then the temple will be destroyed. And this happened in 70 AD. Now, I will dwell deeply on this uh, in the next session because I believe uh, I've spoken a mouthful and I've spoken a lot and I've been on this word study for over an hour and I don't want to overwhelm you. Okay, I don't want to overwhelm you. And I, I just have one, one, one or two more points to emphasize. And before I get to them, uh, please uh, give me a thumbs up on this video. Give me a thumbs up. Share this video. Uh, share this video. And yeah, it will help me with the analytics. Now, 
I also see uh, Kuchitik Nebaru been waiting for this. Uh, yeah, guys on Facebook. Wow, guys. Um, yeah, thank you. It's really encouraging. Ne, uh, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, um, please give me a star. You know, uh, give us a good offering. You know, um, bless the works of the gospel. Uh, and there are, there are also many other ways you can give. Ne? Uh, you can give directly on our website. I'm going to post the link. I'm going to post the link now. Uh, I put the link on Facebook. Uh, let me try putting the link also on on a uh, YouTube. Uh, there is a link here. Ne? Um, if you wanna give, you know, and if you wanna leave a seed, you know, you know, you wanna bless this ministry, please go to Sir Peterson Ministries. Those Um, leave us leave us an offering. You know, yeah, just go in a nice two hundred there for data. You know, five hundred. You know, 1,000, 2,000. You can even partner with us as well. You know, I just put up the, the links in the description. Uh, please connect with us. Please connect uh, and, and leave us an offering, you know, so that the work of the gospel can continue. You know, now we cannot meet physically and stuff like that, but the work still needs to be, to be financed, you know. And also, I will try putting a PDF. Ne, a PDF explaining all these words with this with all these verses and all these dictionaries and i will put it up on my website it will be up on my website during this week just a short pdf explaining it will not be anything fancy i'll just take a word document my notes and then put them into a pdf and i will upload it onto my website okay and then during the week you guys can just go through it and then see the notes okay for ease and for benefit but for now just go onto the website you know uh leave us a nice offering you know and you can also leave me a message with the offering you know and yeah uh, it goes to creating more resources it goes to uh getting better equipment and better software you know better cameras you know the data you know uh, just to encourage us to continue with this ministry uh please consider partnering with Sir Peterson Ministries. Uh, please consider partnering. It really helps us. You know. Uh, yeah, let's let's get a few good offerings. You know, if if uh, at least three or four of you can just go there, you know, leave me an, a, a nice offering. Um, yeah, this time offering time, amen. Offering time is blessing time. Uh, yeah, let's just do that and then yeah. We will, we will be blessed. Um, thank you all for joining me today. I promise that I will keep it to an hour. It is now an hour, 20 minutes, you know. So um, we just did an, an introduction of Matthew 24, of what it speaks about. And then next week, man, we're going to dismantle this. We're going to dismantle this, the science of the end of the age. Because people like teaching a lot on the science of the end of the age. And uh, yeah, I'll be perambulating on those signs uh, next week. So yeah, guys, um, thank you so much for, for having joined us. Um, God bless you. Um, yeah, thank you. See you next, next week. I know I'm stopping it. Uh, yeah, I know I'm stopping it. Uh, yeah. Next week, Rabatena, Bazolani, Rabatena.